To the viewers at home, um, I'm very pleased to introduce you to Ingrid Newkirk, who's the founder of PETA, the world's largest animal advocacy organisation. Um, Ingrid, thank you so much for taking the time to see us. We really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. So before we start talking about PETA, um, could you talk a bit about your very first memory with animals? Um, talk us through that first moment when you had a connection with an animal. When I was born, I suppose this was my first connection with animals, there was already a dog at home named Shawnee, big Irish red setter, much bigger than me as a baby. And we became like brother and sister. So I grew up relating to others who happened not to be human. I knew his facial expressions and his moods, and he knew mine. And we often slept in his basket, or he slept on my bed. And when we went to see my grandmother, both of us got car sick at the same time. So that was my first introduction to caring and loving animals and not wishing any harm to them. In your own words, um, why does advocating uh, for the rights of animals matter? I think advocating for the rights of animals matters very much because if we're people of principle, if we're against violence and exploitation and oppression, we can't simply be against it for those we relate to most closely, like human beings. There has to be that principle of being against it and thinking it doesn't really matter what you look like or what behaviors are familiar to you or how well you know another living being. If that living being feels pain and doesn't want to be captured or killed, then you as a powerful individual should be concerned and try not to engage in acts that hurt him or her. With so much suffering in this world, um, how do we remain positive and how do we stop ourselves from becoming depressed, misanthropic, introverted? Like how do you, what are your, what's your advice on how to stay resilient? I'm often asked about coping mechanisms and I think they're very important for anyone who works with abused animals, children, the elderly, in war, anything like that. And um, I believe that you can discipline yourself to blot out the things that will sink you, to not dwell or wallow in the horror that is factual, it's taking place everywhere. People are doing awful things to other human beings, and I believe you just have to not think about that and think about what you can do, because we're very powerful. Each of us buys things that have an impact on the world and on other living beings. Um, each of us says things that are either educational or go along with something that's oppressive. There's so much we can do that, um, that can keep you positive. Are humans born with compassion or is it something that we are taught? I don't know that human beings are necessarily born with compassion, although some certainly are. But for many of us, it's learned and many of us make a lot of mistakes and have our eyes opened by certain things. I know I did. I always fished when I was growing up. I had my first fur coat at 19, and I loved animals. But back then, nobody really helped me make the connection. I just knew you shouldn't set fire to a cat or tire a firework to a dog's tail. But I didn't think about factory farming. I didn't think about steel traps or fur farming. I didn't think about animals in the lab. So animal rights activists, I think, can help people develop empathy, give them understanding, show them their choices, and bring them along. If somebody is a sociopath, that obviously isn't going to work. But most people have the capacity to be kind. That's good to know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> gives us hope. So Maybe. <laughs> let's, let's talk a bit about Peter. Why and when did you start Peter? We started Peter in 1980. And I started it for the simple reason that growing up thinking that I was, quote, an animal lover, I hadn't realized so much. And yet, bit by bit, I had come to see the various ways in which animals suffer because of things I did unthinkingly like buy a shampoo that was tested down a rabbit's throat or in her eyes. Um, all sorts of things, dissection in school, for example, which is common in the United States, although we're wiping it out. Now it can be replaced with computers. I found a pig on a farm who had been abandoned and was dying, and that pig changed my diet. 
because while I was setting out to prosecute the person who had been so awfully cruel to this pig, it occurred to me that, of course, slaughterhouses are disgusting, terribly cruel places, and here I was paying money for someone to make a pig into pork chops so I could eat that individual, and I didn't want to support that anymore. So I thought, let's start a group and tell everybody how bad things are for animals and what they can do. That's the important thing, the choices they have, the kind choices they can make. With obviously, you know, the, the organization's grown massively over the, over the years, um, and you have a huge team all over the world. Uh, your, your staff have um, called you uh, a superhuman, you know, because you are so involved and you're so part of it. What are some of the challenges with um, being part of such a large organization, or running such a large organization? I think part of the challenge of being a large organization is that people sometimes say, oh, well, you don't need our funds or our support. We'll work locally. And working locally is great, but don't we want the biggest possible force we can? You know, if you look at us, in the scheme of things, we're not that big when you compare us to even one of our enemies, a big pharmaceutical company or a big international meat conglomerate or the laboratories. So in the scheme of things, we're small, and we need everybody behind us. So we need a lot of support. And the other thing, of course, is complacency on the part of human beings who, for convenience sake, don't really want to hear the message. But we'll overcome that. What have been some of the most notable achievements of Peter that come to, comes to mind? Every week, we have a victory for animals, which makes me so happy because it seems to be happening exponentially. And that's not to make light of the fact that the enormity of the suffering is overwhelming. But in the last year alone, uh, the largest circus on earth, Ringling Brothers, has not only taken animals off the uh, road, but has closed down. Uh, we have Tesla, which said it would not have um, any vegan options, now having all vegan leather, uh, vegan leather interiors in its cars. Uh, we have stopped some major experiments. We've stopped the National Institutes of Health, which is the largest funder of experiments in the world, from using monkey mothers and babies in deprivation experiments, something that had been going on from the 50s. So every week brings new victories. We see vegan starter kits flying off our website, flying off the shelves, and more vegan options coming in the stores. We've had the very first prosecutions and convictions of shearers, sheep shearers, in Australia ever in history for cruelty to sheep in the shearing sheds. That's brilliant. And out of all the campaigns this, over the years, is, is there one that stands out that you're most proud of? I think I wouldn't use the word proud, but happy that we accomplished something wonderful for the very first time was the conviction of an experimenter in the first year of our existence for cruelty to monkeys. And that was a hideous case. But what it did was wake people up to the fact that they could get things done and take them behind the scenes in a laboratory and show them how awful things were for the animals, and still are in many places. What do you think about SeaWorld, and will we see an end to it in the next few years? SeaWorld is sinking, as we like to say, and they've already had to make many changes since Blackfish, the documentary, came out. We are outside SeaWorlds every day of the week with virtual reality shows about orcas. We are protesting them. We've interrupted their parades. We've bought stock, and we're harassing them in that way until they let the orcas and the dolphins and all the marine animals go, and they will close down. There's no question in my mind. One of the campaigns that stands out most for me is that we managed to stop all crash tests on animals, pigs, baboons, you name it, all over the world. The last domino to fall was General Motors, which owned Vauxhall, and we had got undercover footage that showed them smashing animals into walls in crash tests. Today, if you turn on the TV or look on the internet, you see mannequins, and they're computerized, they give better data, and that's because we stopped all the animal crash tests. 
So let's talk a little bit about the fierce criticism that Peter receives over what the years. <laughs> <laughs> Which is obviously natural being a large organization coming up against the status quo. Um, there's a few, there's lots of different ones, but let's pick out just a couple. So um, the one, of the, one of the ones that pe the critics often talk about is use of nudity, which I'm sure you um, uh, talk about a lot. So critics often say that this dilutes the message. Can you talk a bit about why Peter stands by this form of campaigning and, and why people are so obsessed with why nudity is such a negative thing? It's funny that people are obsessed with our use of what they call nudity. It really is. There's usually a banner or a bikini, but it wouldn't matter. I mean, I'm a woman, it's my body, and the women who pose for us, they're making a social political statement and it's their business. So. It used to be that brothers and husbands and so on would tell them to cover up. Fathers would tell them, you know, make sure that skirt is below your knees and don't show too much cleavage. There came a time in the 60s when my wave of feminists said, don't tell us what to do. We'll use our bodies how we wish to. And so people should just back off. That's a great answer. <laughs> um, you're an organization who has come, also come under fire about anim, animal euthanasia. Can you talk a bit about why um, the critics feel this goes against the vegan philosophy and how PETA is in fact helping animals? Killing indiscriminately is not the same as euthanasia. Why do you think many people can't distinguish between these two things? I think it's difficult for people when they hear that an animal rights organization euthanizes. And there is a difference between if you string up a wonderful animal and make a sandwich out of them to if someone brings you, as happens in our case, an old animal who's racked with pain and they don't have a job, they don't have the money to pay for veterinary care to end that suffering and we do that for nothing. We let them be with the animal in the final moments and it's a, it's a service, a community service that I'm afraid some of the hobby shelters, as I call them, turn their backs on those people because they don't want to be tainted by saying they euthanize. They only want to adopt. We are not in the adoption business mostly because we pass on animals who are adoptable to high volume shelters, but we do perform euthanasia services for those animals who belong to the poor, who are extremely aggressive, who are racked with cancer, who have been hit by cars and those sorts of things. And all the pictures are on our website and can be seen. And it would make a hard-hearted person say, don't help those animals and those people. It must be a very difficult job um, having to do that, be a part of that. It's terribly difficult and it takes a big strain. And when you see the video that we do of our field workers, I love each one of them dearly because they have to go through an awful lot sometimes, an emotional strain to be there in the final moments when an animal needs to leave this planet that probably hasn't cared for them very well and maybe give the first nice pat or kind word to that animal. So it is hard. What can be, can be done about group, front groups like Rick Berman, <laughs> <laughs> who work to undermine organizations like PETA, Humane Society of America, with her, with her unending kind of piles of propaganda, websites, articles, TV, TV adverts. Um, can you talk a little bit about the tactics people like Rick Berman and his associates are up to? Because he's, he's him and many other people like him. There are people like this uh, Rick Berman enterprise that are like bad frat boys who are making a lot of money of attacking groups like Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, attacking the minimum wage, attacking the anti-tobacco lobby, and of course attacking animal rights activists. It's almost a badge of honor to be attacked by them because you know then that they have to pay attention because you are making changes in the marketplace. I tell people just ignore them, we've got work to do, and they have to pay for every single thing that they do. So Berman may get fat and rich, but he'll probably die of a heart attack. And um, I'm sorry, I wish he'd become a vegan and start to promote animal rights instead of this awfully evil thing that he's trying to do and that will one day catch up with him. Um, let's talk a little bit about grassroots activism. How can we all become better activists? 
It's so wonderful that every single person has the power to be a grassroots activist. Every single person eats, so they can start there. They wear clothes, one hopes, so they can start there. They buy things, and they can influence the retailers and the businesses that put things on the market just by saying a word or by talking to a shop manager. And they can give gifts that are vegan. They can talk to people, captive people in the lift or at the grocery line or their friends, their family. They can cook for people. They can join demonstrations. They can call into radio and television shows. They can get onto social media and show videos. It is endless what people can do. The enormous power of the consumer can never be underestimated. How can we encourage other people to stand up for animals when so many people seem to not care? I don't know. <laughs> That's a satisfactory answer. <laughs> That's an answer. That's an answer. It is difficult. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It's difficult. How can we encourage people? Like, talk us through that moment when you went, because obviously you said at one point you, you, you realised you loved animals, but then you also ate them, and there must have been a shift. Like, maybe talk us through that shift. Was there a shift in your mind? Was it gradual? How... What influenced you? I think you talked about the pig, didn't you? But yeah. was there kind of an emotional shift? If I look at myself and the experiences that have changed my mind and made me change my habits, I know that there's hope for almost everybody to embrace an understanding of animals and animal rights, to see the justice of it. So I encourage everybody to talk to people and find out what they care about now. Maybe it's the environment. Maybe it's a relative who's had a heart attack. Maybe it's their child who's coming up in a violent world. Find an entree, an entry point, and then you have the resources at your fingertips. They're as close as the web to be able to help people understand and see what a difference they can make. Sometimes it's an experience, as with me, I was given some... Uh, uh, lobsters at, as a treat at a restaurant and told to pick one to broil or boil. And I didn't think of it at the time. It was years ago. I picked one. He or she came back to the table dead, put the lobster in my mouth and burst into tears because I suddenly subconsciously had thought maybe wiggling the antenna at me meant that that was a form of communication and I had missed it and I had sent them to their death in the grill. So I think it, you never know. Say to someone, would you eat your cat? And then have a discussion. You never know what's going to influence them. It's always a switch of some sort that just flicks. Yeah, my, my I didn't put that artfully. Yeah, no, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. What switched it for me was seeing a cat run over in the street, oh. a neighbor's cat who I loved, and experiencing and connecting with the animal as it died. It kind of was just a switch, and I... And after that, I just I never touched meat and yeah, animal good. products again. Yeah. So I mean, you never, never know. And I used to eat is. steak for breakfast. <laughs> I grew up Me on a farm, too. so <laughs> massive I shift. I used to walk around with um, raw hamburger in my hand right. and put capers in it and yeah. sauce while I was doing things in the kennel. Wow. It never. Yeah, the I connection. Know. The same with me. I grew up on a farm with animals, and I never connected. Um, my family thought I was crazy when I went vegan. <laughs> Um, what is the biggest threat to the vegan movement moving forward? What is, what is, the, what is the biggest uh, barrier, do you think? I think the biggest barrier to progress, but we're breaking that barrier down, is cultural. You see that, for example, we have a very strong presence in China, but in China it's accepted that by the majority and by the government that dogs will be beaten to death on the street. We have a presence and there is a growing number of vegan groups in UAE, for example. But over the years, um, being Muslim has come to mean eating meat. Um, people now are saying, well, maybe with the Eid, we don't have to kill a goat. We can give offerings of fruit and veg. I mean, you're seeing these things, bullfighting, fading out from being a tradition that was absolutely set in cement in Spain to being something the majority now objects to and is being banned town by town. So I think culturally there are barriers, but they are going to go away. One last question I forgot to ask you was, um, what do you want your legacy to be? I have prepared a will to guarantee my legacy 
uh, if my body remains intact. And in my will, which uh, says my body is to be given to Peter, I've also specified that my activism can continue with part of my liver going to France to protest foie gras, my um, ear going to Canada to hear the crying of the seals, if that's still going on when I die, and different parts of my body given to demonstrations to draw attention to the fact that animals suffer. Some of my flesh will definitely be barbecued with onions because I want people to say, what's that wonderful smell? And then come by and think, oh, it's her. <laughs> because we are all the same. We are all flesh and blood and feelings.